Now, the idea of the sublime reminds me of the character of Asini from the movie Princess Bride, who repeatedly says, inconceivable, and he uses it for all kinds of things, which has the negative effect of diluting its meaning. And eventually, the downturned sword fighter, Inigo Montoya, played by Mandy Patinkin, calls him out with the famous line, you keep using that word, I do not think it means what you think it means. Honestly, you could replace the word inconceivable with the word sublime. People use it while posting hashtags on selfies while ziplining. They use it to describe art they love, and they use it to describe emotional experiences. The original meaning of the word has been muddied, and thereby the very concept of the sublime diluted. But the idea of the sublime is important in our understanding of creative works of art in our day-to-day -day life as Christians. If we're going to live wholehearted, holistic lives, we must have an idea of the sublime that brings together and gives meaning to both our creativity and our theology. Welcome. I'm Joel Pelsu, president of Arts Entertainment Ministries, where we mentor artists and creative professionals to succeed creatively and grow spiritually. If God has called you into a creative career, you need to know you are not alone. We have videos and blogs and online courses created just for you, and you can find them by using the links down below. And why do we do this, you might wonder. We do this to encourage and equip you so that you have the confidence working as a Christian in the arts, media, or the entertainment industry. Whether you live in a small market, you work remotely, or if you live and work like right here, major market like LA, New York, London, and so on. Now, before we jump in, I wanna thank you for taking the time to watch this video and ask one favor, of course, take one second, hit the like button, subscribe to our channel. It really helps people find this content. It makes a difference. Do that right now. Now, what do we mean when we say something is sublime? And does this thing we call sublime have any relationship with our faith? Do we get our definition of sublime from art schools who disconnect the sublime from anything supernatural? Or do we anchor our definition of the sublime in something that makes sense of all of life, including the physical world and supernatural reality? And where do we find the sublime in the Bible? That's what I want to share with you today. Let's start with the basic sense of beauty versus sublime. If we think about it, it's easy to appreciate a lovely afternoon walking by a well-designed garden or an open field filled with flowers. It's wonderful to stop in the middle of a satisfying conversation and be thankful for a good friend. And it may also be easy to appreciate the beauty of a civil society in which people respect one another and their property. But what about those moments where the beauty is so moving that it stirs up something deep within our soul? The greatest novels and films are filled with these moments. Many artists are reaching to create these moments. The return of a loved one you thought was dead, the rescue of the innocent from evil men, or the sight of something so pristine and perfect that it leaves you breathless. These are the moments when our ability to take in such beauty is just not enough. Our faculties were not designed to take in all of the glory of the entire universe in one moment. For the, all the glory we can behold, our human senses are limited, especially so because of the fall. It is part of the image of God in us where we have the sampling of grandeur so we can have an appreciation of the beauty of God and of heaven, but the scale and proportions are beyond what our senses can appreciate. And the pure force of great forgiveness and redemption is beyond what our sinful hearts and minds can naturally understand. This is the heart of what is meant by the sublime. For most of history, the term sublime referred to the highest form of beauty, which gave us the greatest overwhelming sense of pleasure. And it served as a signpost for the beauty and glory of God. This definition is what you might have found in Webster's Dictionary. For thousands of years, this is how we thought about it. It was obvious to people that the beauty we encounter on earth mirrors the beauty of God himself. But sadly, art schools and philosophers contemplating aesthetics in recent centuries have abandoned this idea, trading it in for the godless machinations of Immanuel Kant. This is because Kant declared that beauty points to nothing and insisted the overwhelming experience of the sublime is nothing more than our mind and our reason recognizing our inability through our senses to fully comprehend the scope and scale of beauty. He also put terror in this idea of we're overwhelmed by something beautiful or something terrible and horrifying. It's just that overwhelm that he goes to for the sublime. And looking at these proportions that are just beyond our ability to perceive. 
Now this is because the sheer overwhelming nature of something sublime is too great for our senses to comprehend. Kant was the key philosopher to join the conversation, but he divorced the sublime from God, from heaven, and anything spiritual. Sadly, Kant is really the father of aesthetics as taught in many so-called great art programs in the world today. So whereas before Kant and even other thinkers after Kant agreed, overwhelming beauty lifts the soul and points us to God and to the supernatural, whether it's the great classics of Homer or artwork of J.W. Turner, these things point us to something beyond ourselves, something transcendent. But Kant places the sublime within our mind, focuses only on the ability to perceive, eliminating the heavens and God from the conversation. Now, why do I bring this up? It is one of the key reasons why the art world has an aesthetic that is more godless than other eras previously. See, theologians and Christians see this as evidence of grandeur of God and his creation, and evidence of the limits of our humanity and even the results of the fall. We cannot see God and live. We cannot perceive or even take in all the grandeur of God or the universe, or even the overwhelming idea of the God of the universe would love us enough to become a sacrifice for our sins. To be overwhelmed by the beauty of God, to experience the sublime, overwhelming love of God. So let's look at some examples of where we see this concept of the sublime in the Bible. First, Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6. Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I get up. You understand my thought from far away. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, Lord, you know it all. You've encircled me behind and in front. You placed your hand upon me. And here it is. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot comprehend it. That's the sublime. Or another verse, Isaiah 6, when Isaiah tells us the train of God's robe fills the temple. In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. It's hard to imagine. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. It goes on to describe two wings to cover their faces, two for their feet, and two they were flying. And they're calling to the Lord, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. This would be sublime. And what does he say? Woe to me, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. He is completely undone in the presence of God. It is a sublime experience. Or look at Exodus 33, when Moses asked to see God. Then Moses said, Now show me your glory, as if. He could take it in. And God says in verse 20, You cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. This is not just the sublime. This is sublime on a whole other level. We can't even sit in his presence. And what about the Gospels? Jesus risen from the tomb? Think about it. To comprehend that a man you saw die before your very eyes. Without question, he was completely dead. Not mostly dead, like in Princess Bride. All dead. Completely dead. Buried in the tomb. And the tomb was guarded heavily. So then to see this man walking around alive, it would be shocking. It would be inconceivable and it would be sublime. Your senses and mind would work hard to comprehend. How could this be? How could you comprehend such a feat? But in the end, it's beyond our ability to fully comprehend how it all worked. It simply doesn't make sense to our mortal minds. This very sublime nature of the resurrection is part of the need for faith. It is not easy to believe. It's not simple and obvious. It's overwhelming beyond anything we have ever seen or heard. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9 through 11. What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived. We couldn't even conceive it. The things God has prepared for those who love him, no mind has conceived or understood. To write it differently, to encounter the very sublime nature of God himself. And what about the book of Revelation? The grandeur of this new Jerusalem is nearly impossible to comprehend. John does best to paint us a glorious picture of what it will be like in the new heavens and the new earth. Or chapter 21, verses 22 to 27. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and the Lamb is its lamp. 
hard to imagine. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does anything that is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And then one other passage from Revelations, chapter 22, 1 through 5. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city, on each side of the river stood a tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. How does a tree do that? And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. There will be no need for the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. But consider this. What may be the most amazing thing to us when we encounter this glorious new Jerusalem is that we will not be so undone by the sheer scale and beauty because we'll be made like him. We find this in 1 John 3, 2. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. But what about the sublime beauty in a story? You see, there's no story more sublime than Scripture. There's no character more sublime than God himself. Think about it. A story that began in a humble garden and ends in an elegant city endures heartache and joy as part of the journey. And in this story, you find a sublime beauty of hope beyond death, the light that overcomes darkness, and the beauty that bursts forth from the ashes. These stories move our hearts, and our very soul aches for the truth hidden in these stories. The films, novels, and theater plays we so dearly love today are but echoes of what C.S. Lewis calls the true myth, which is the gospel. For the gospel is a story that grips our imagination because it sounds so deep and profound, so drenched in grace for wretched souls like ours that it scarcely seems real. Though it lures our heart towards such a loving God, we struggle with unbelief at such extravagant and never-ending love. It would be easier to dismiss such grand love and sacrifice as mere myth or fairy tale, but the aroma of Christ pierces our senses with a truth we cannot deny. Like Peter, tempted to leave as we may be, all Christ's disciples will finally admit to ourselves and to Jesus, where else would we go? You, Jesus, have the words of eternal life. At the heart of this is the sublime beauty of sacrificial love. While the world seeks power and self-protection, this incarnate one seeks humility. Jesus himself seeks humility and love that leads to sacrifice. And while the world understands power, war, and fighting, this God-man does the unfathomable, the unbelievable, the incomprehensible. He pursues forgiveness, sacrifice, and love. It is the very thing we crave and yet the thing we have learned not to believe in. Our cynicism, bitterness, and fear tell us that such love and beauty cannot be found. And yet we know that if it were found, it would be the undoing of our sin and shame. The chains of addiction and shame would fall to the ground. No wonder that when we first put our faith in Christ, it transformed our lives. This is what it means to fully encounter the Jesus who washes our feet and then dies for our sins. This is where we find the overwhelming grace and the forgiveness of great sinners. It's the one place we finally experience the transformation we long for as Christ takes our filthy rags and exchanges them for his righteous robe of pure white. So what does all this mean? All of this discussion of the sublime should create in us a longing for heaven. It should whet our appetite for the glory of becoming like Christ and the beauty of living in the city of God. Like little children who have been kept happy at a kid's table with peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, we will finally be invited to the great feast. And in that day, we will have glorified bodies and glorified senses. And that day our capacity will be so increased, we will be able to see God face to face and behold his beauty and savor it without having to look away. Like standing at a mountain overlooking the Rockies, seeing for miles and miles and miles, we will see the beauty upon beauty all over the new Jerusalem. And no longer will we be undone like Isaiah. 
because our sin will no longer be in our hearts. We'll never mar and scar our conscience. It won't cover us in shame or limit our capacity to enjoy the beauty of God or his creation. We will begin to create art that reflects a new dimension, a new level of magnetic appeal, new ideas that we've only begun to understand. As we enter a new era, this will be a new kind of creative breakthrough. This is part of what we long for. It is as if our hearts echo the longing of King David to sing a new song unto the Lord. But that perfect song has eluded us before. What great art will we create in the new life with a new body, new senses, living in a new Jerusalem where we can behold the glory of God? What new ideas, new groundbreaking concepts will we be able to communicate? This is where we're headed. We will live in the presence of God and it will not overwhelm us. And everything sublime is supposed to beckon our hearts and souls to yearn for that day, to cry, Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. We want to be in his presence, even though we know we need to be faithful where he calls us today. So I want to ask you a favor. Can you share down below, has this helped you understand the sublime in the Bible? Has it helped you see how great art can awaken a sense of the sublime in your audience and create a longing in them for heaven? As always, thank you for taking the time to watch this video. Again, please take a moment, hit the like button and subscribe. Check the links below to subscribe to emails and learn about our online courses. And don't forget, tell me how this idea of the sublime is reflected in your work, how it can create a yearning for a relationship with God in your art, and how it helps you to worship God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. This is my prayer for you. May you worship God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. May you be undone by his majesty and glory, experiencing how sublime it is to be the presence of God, knowing what it is like to feel your soul being lifted out of the mundane as you encounter God. And may you somehow echo that joy and invite your audience to experience the sublime and discover a yearning for the forgiveness of Christ and life in heaven with God himself. Thank you for watching. God bless. Thank you.